everybody, welcome to Ask Dr. Testosterone, starring Dr. George Tuliados, brought to you by his website, gtool.com. That's G T O U L.com. You can find his book there, Bodybuilding The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Excellent primer on anabolics. It's also available on Amazon.com and Dr. Tuliados. Also, every month in the pages of Muscular Development, you can find his column. And uh, he's got all kinds of stuff going on, Doctor. How are you today, sir? All the way from Athens, Greece. I'm fine, Ron. Thank you. Uh, I just got the PDF email from Alan Golnick. Uh, the interview was really good. Uh, how I was written down in the photographs and I share it with my Greek audience and uh, they think this is uh, very representative for me, my for my international career. So thanks to you, to Alan, to Steve, and of course to Tim and uh, Bill. Yes, I was open. Um, I was outspoken about the steroid use, and uh, for the sake of the people, you know, to understand. And when you open yourself, then they realize that you are honest. But they they start opening up themselves also. So honesty yeah. is what it takes to speak about drugs. If you say no, I'm not using, then we cannot uh, communicate uh, frankly because. Uh, we have to be honest and outspoken and realize what we do and exchange our mutual uh, mistakes in order to improve. Yeah. I see that you do, uh, you know, on your social media I follow, you do a lot of speaking. You, do a, you go to a lot of conferences, a lot of uh, yes. you know, gatherings of medical professionals. You know, yes, seminars, uh, congresses also. Um, I have taken part in three congresses, medical congresses. Two was about, uh, one is was anti-aging, the other was sport medicine, and the other one was psychiatry, but uh, two of them I spoke about HRT, and the other one about uh, overtraining and uh, the, the the blood work during overtraining. Yeah. But through my seminars in bodybuilding, since I, st uh, I first published my very first book in 2012, yeah. I, across all, all the country I have uh, given almost 30 seminars to different countries, yes, uh, in order to promote my book also, yeah. <clears throat> online also, yes, speak about training, nutrition, drugs, and also uh, prevention about this. Okay, uh, 17 appearances on television and six appearances on radio. Wow. Do, yeah. Do you, you know, in America, if you did that, you'd still get some stupid questions about steroids because, you know, the media, like most mainstream people are just yeah. very... They're, they're, they're ignorant. Informed. Yeah. yeah. The journalists are ignorant, and they, they just want a small reason to make it, uh, you know, to to magnify it and make a fuss out of it. Yeah. And they say, creatine is this a steroid? <laughs> Absolutely. I recall it gets uh, outrageous about this, and uh, it's funny, of course. But uh, steroids, okay, we give a bad name, and doctors are prejudiced and uh, uh, very skeptical, but they can heal in minor doses, they are very cheap, they are prescribed, and uh, they can uh, cure six to seven different kind of diseases. Mm. All right. All right. Well, doctor, we are here to answer some questions from your viewers, your fans. Let's get right to it. Number one, Dr. T, do certain steroids such as Winstrol drop your blood glucose and aid <coughs> in glycogen replenishment? I personally always feel like my blood sugar is low on anabolic androgenic steroids. Okay. Blood sugar. Did I say blood pressure? Now, the best drug about the best drugs about glycogen retention are the ones that are very androgenic but also estrogenic. Dianabol is one of them because it causes water retention. It's a derivative of methyl testosterone. It highly aromatizes and this aromatization process with this water retention plus the, the carbohydrate in starchy form forms the muscle glycogen. Now, Winstrol is a DHT derivative, also low androgenic, that does not lead to any water retention and either gynecomastia or perhaps also muscle glycogen. However, as Peter Van Mol, the big cat who passed away last year from Belgium, he was a genius about steroids. He used to write with Bill Welling in bodybuilding.com, told me that stanozolol and Trembolon are among the two very, uh, the most uh, anabolic uh, injectables, okay? Trembolone comes first and then comes stenozolol. Mm. It's 500 uh, anabolic index and 330. Now, what they do is, uh, I mean, they are very anabolic, 
but they are very anabolic not because of the steroid molecule itself, but also because they suppress the catabolic cortisol. Mm -hmm. Now, cortisol we know that is responsible for increasing blood sugar through gluconeogenesis. Now, suppressing cortisol, uh, as a result, uh, we obviously will mean that we're going to have a hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, he, he used to tell me that when we should, when we have an injection of trembolone, we may feel hypoglycemic afterwards. So this is my the uh, theory about this question. And also, windshield does not contribute to any water retention, therefore no muscle glycogen. Um, it's a DHT derivative that does not aromatize. Yeah. Also has the ability to suppress SHBG and ele elevate. It can be medically prescribed also for low sex drive because windshield and Anavar do the same thing as Proviron or Masteron that bind tightly to SHBG and elevate the free testosterone. Uh, so, yes, this is my answer to this question. Okay. <clears throat> Next one tells you he is a lean 41-year-old male on TRT, armor thyroid and metformin, A1C of 5.0 to 5.2, family history of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Is there any merit to basal dosing of an ultra-long-lasting insulin, such as Traceba or Decludec, Decludec, in order to allow the beta cells to quote unquote rest. It seems like a somewhat logical idea, but didn't know if there is any science behind it. This is this is thought, this speculation is true that when we introduce exogenous insulin, we give a rest to pancreas in order to overstimulate the the isolates of Langerhans, the pancreatic cells alpha and beta, in order to release insulin. Uh, now, this guy has a family history to type 1 and type 2. Type 1, you're born with it. Yeah. Type 2, you become with it. You can reverse type 2 with medications such as metformin, which is a hypoglycemic drug that improves insulin sensitivity. Yeah. It cuts off gluconeogenesis and makes insulin receptors more prominent to glucose in the small intestine. And it also, uh, but this does not interfere with insulin release. And um, uh, the other thing is, of course, by diet, cut the sugars, cut, um, uh, lower the, the starchy carbs, in elevate good fats, fiber, and lean animal protein. And of course, with exercise, because by building muscle tissue, we lower our mental fat, and this improves insulin sensitivity. Now, I don't think that this guy with 5.2 A1C glyceric hemoglobin will be necessary to introduce any insulin injection. He can use metformin just in case. Of course, he, if he's into growth hormone, he has to use berberine or afterwards uh, metformin because metformin may lower your IGF-1 and mTOR. Hmm. And uh, yes, I think exercise diet, keto diet also is very effective for insulin sensitivity. Exercise diet and metformin are, are fair enough in order to deal with this 5.2 and his family history, of course. But if you're di uh, type 2 diabetes and you exercise your diet and you use metformin, I don't believe there is any need of insulin. Some people who are already fat with type 2, they, don't, they, they still eat junk. They do not take regularly their metformin mm -hmm. and they don't exercise. They may you need to be introduced into insulin as well because they do not cooperate with the doctor. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> We have a show. I don't know if you ever seen a show called My Six Hundred Pound Life. It's a no. you know the it's very obese people, and it's an hour long show, and it, it's the same doctor, now as a, now as a Darian, especially in Houston, Texas, and the whole the whole show is him battling these people. Some of them cooperate and do what they're supposed to, because otherwise they're going to die very soon. They're more. You see how important uh, Ron is bodybuilding, lifting, dieting. Yeah. Okay, we have the the. The ugly side of, of steroid, but bodybuilding is the healthiest lifestyle, yeah. accompanied with nutrition, and it gives you longevity. It makes you look younger and beautiful. Yeah. So not just about looks, but how the internal organs also work. Right. So I always tell people, you know, abusing steroids, and that, that then it's not as healthy. But natural bodybuilding or bodybuilding on just legitimate TRT it's dose. Lifestyle, discipline, lifestyle. Yes. It's a very, very healthy lifestyle. No other sport is like this. No. Next question. Uh, this is good. It's about cankle. This guy calls it uh, ankle edema. We call it cankles. 
That's when your calves and your ankles are the same size because of uh, either your fat or it's water retention. So this gentleman wants to know, what is the cause of ankle edema on steroid cycle? I checked E2 and prolactin. It is normal on blood work. Doctor, all episodes are so informative. Ankle edema. So specifically, why would you retain water in your ankles on steroids? The answer is aldosterone. This is a hormone released from the adrenals. It is supposed to hold sodium and water as a result. Hmm. Therefore, we have the formation of edema. And uh, aldosterone also is blocked either by when we use table salt because we shut off its homeostatic mechanism. Hmm. Just like we drink all water and we shut off antidiuretic hormone and we diurate. So the same happens with uh, aldosterone and the day before glycogen depletion, we use a lot of stable salt in order to shut off the aldosterone and not to hold water afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, aldosterone, yes, is released by steroids. This is how steroids, this is the fundamental uh, theory, how steroids elevate blood pressure. And spironolactone blocks aldosterone in order to lower blood pressure also. It also keeps potassium, but it flushes away all the minerals and, and sodium as well. Mm. Okay. So yes, spironolactone blocks aldosterone mainly, blocks aldosterone, yes. Gotcha. Okay. So this is, yes, and Rich Gaspar used to, used to say that when I'm kind of puffy, I watch out my ankles that are not dry and, uh, you know, ripped. <laughs> Here, no, this is neither here nor there, but you know, Chris Bumstead, who's the second best classic physique professional in the world, he suffers from Berger's disease. It was a kidney. Berger's disease is, uh, is induced by smoking in the arteries of the foot. Oh. I remember that in pathology. He had uh, such bad ankle edema last year uh, in the weeks leading up to the Olympia. I don't know if you saw any of the videos. He could push his fingers into his ankles, and it, the, the two holes would stay there for about a minute before they started filling back out. There is a case in pathology which is called elephantitis, means yeah, elephant toe. Yeah, it's yeah. so, and this is based on lymph nodes and lymphatic circulation and becomes so swollen the, the foot. You know, it's, yeah, I've seen it's, it's disgusting. It's really nasty. Okay, next question. Hey, Doc, great show so far. I would like to ask, is there a potential for liver strain while on injectables? Because, yeah, we always think liver from oral, yes. you're going to hurt your liver, but what about injectables? There was a, an article of William Llewellyn uh, two years ago, I think, on muscular development, and he said, Trembolone, is it liver toxic? And the answer is according to the dose. So Trembolone is uh, one of the most harsh steroids and side effects also, but it's not 17 alkylated. However, if you abuse it up to 400 milligrams per week, it may lead to transaminemia, not as other 17 alkylated orals. But uh, the answer is uh, time and dose dependent of abuse. So yes, even primobolan, I was, uh, I was using up to 600 milligrams primobolan 20 years ago, and uh, along with um, testosterone or decadrabolintho. So all of them were not supposed to be liver toxic. However, along with overtraining, I could realize three digital ALT and AST, but not super high, for instance, 120. But when I was using back halotestin and winstrol and uh, anavar alongside, my liver enzymes reached up to 330. Wow. So, yes. Uh, that's why I recommend to use it sublingually. It, it resembles the injectable form. But uh, the answer is uh, up to the dose. Now, when I use, for instance, five, 50 milligrams of DECA per week, yeah. there's no problem at all. Uh, apart from this, it's the, the recommended medical dose for prescription. So, <clears throat> yes, it's according to the dose and the time, of the, uh, the, the duration of the abuse. So all injectables, <coughs> can, all injectables can be liver toxic if taken in high Testosterone, no. testosterone cannot, but testosterone over 500 milligrams may lower your HDL, for instance, yeah. which, is, which, is worse for that, which is worse than uh, having liver enzymes because you need a month to elevate it. It's very stubborn, the HDL. Liver enzymes, they fluctuate and they can be suppressed by an injection of glutathione, for instance. Hmm. They also interfere with overtraining. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, I believe it's a SARM. MK677 is a very popular SARM, correct? Yes. Okay, so yes. guy's been, I think this guy's been asking this question for a few yes, weeks. Yes, we have, we have answered this before. Yeah. But let's, uh, 
Would and you like to? It's a very, very popular, uh, I'm going to yeah. call it a drug. What's your opinion on MK677? Does it have the potential for improving body composition positively? Also, being a GH secretagogue, is there a possibility to raise endogenous IFG1, IGF1 levels so much as cancer problems could arise? Okay, the answer is no and no. So, MK677 is an oral sum supposed to elevate your endogenous DH. So, it's a growth hormone releasing hormone of peptide. Yeah. Uh, it's safer, it's prescribed also, as Thomas said, Thomas O'Connor said, for anti aging clinics because it's safer. But because of the fact it's safer, it's less effective for, uh, for performance enhancing uh, purposes mm -hmm. and, co and uh, also cosmetic uh, effects. Yeah. So it's, maybe it's in the long term, maybe effective for rejuvenation and anti-aging, you know, recovery. But I don't think this elevation of endogenous growth hormone will be so substantial in order to uh, mm -hmm. promote uh, muscle growth Perhaps in the long term some fat burning because growth hormone in the in, in the lowest levels is capable of beta oxidation and fat burn. The gains come when IGF comes into play in higher doses. Mm. So I think it's a age managing purposes and perhaps some fat burning in the long term. Yeah. But, but don't count it don't count on it as with GH that is very expensive of course. I mean everybody wishes uh, there was something that acted just like GH but was a fraction of the price. But when something seems too good to be true, it usually is too good to be true. Listen, if I have a thousand dollars to spend either on GH or either on steroids and the rest of the drug, I will try, of course, steroids because they act in the short term. Mm. Unlike with a thousand dollars with GH, that may not be enough in order to see the the results, the cost effect result. Yeah. So maybe you need a six month non stop use of growth hormone in order to realize some effects. However, in this thing, smart with steroids, you're going to change your body. Right. Yeah. And there's so much uh, underdose, so much bad, you know, g generic GH out there that to spend all that money six months later to realize that it wasn't, it wasn't working, you'd feel pretty stupid, I can imagine. But I believe it, the FPP pros in Olympia level, they do not rely just on steroids, of course. They're not in to make it in Olympia, yes. You need also the growth factors. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, next question is: Saw palmetto any good for prostate health during and after AS, AAS and testo use? I don't know why they always like think testosterone is something different from steroids. Have you any dose suggestion or other supplements that you think can be useful without considering prostate drugs? Well, uh, supplement is supposed to do the the what finasteride and testosterone do the the. Um, to stop the reduction of testosterone, dehydrate testosterone, and the 5 a reductase enzyme activity. Yeah. But I, d I don't think that, of course, a, a supplement have the same effect as a drug, of course. Mm. Uh, may, you may use it, for instance, if you have a BPH, a benign prostatic hypertrophy, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, for prevention rules, yeah. uh, after the age of 50, maybe. Uh, I don't think that's any concern before 50 at the IO forties, And also you can combine the sopalmetto with lycopene, which is a carotenoid coming from tomato past sauce. Okay. It's also preventing for the uh, cancer of the prostate gland. Hmm. Like, but lycopene, yeah. Lycopene. lycopene, lycopene. It gives the red uh, color to tomatoes. Right. Also to uh, watermelons. Oh, okay. Yeah, and... Uh, <clears throat> Moreover, I wouldn't uh, rely on uh, sopalmetto for if I'm bald and I have a main body baldness and androgenic alopecia, oh. because the five hydroxyl inhibitors are effective for this effect. This, oh. yes, the baldness. But no, I think just prevention after your fifties. Um, yes, but uh, you have to take care of your uh, PSA, also digital rectal examination, every six months or once a year. Yeah, once a year is fine. <laughs> okay. Have you tried the finger? Yeah, I mean, hmm, it's uncomfortable. Okay, next question. Is post-cycle gyno possible <laughs> even after months? I think yes. Can it be related to the type of AAS used and doses? you have any suggestions yeah. on how to avoid or manage it? So this mm. Can you get gyno yeah, months and months myself, after a cycle? 
Yes, I noticed myself this, and uh, also some clients of mine and some patients of mine realize that they they realize a lump over here and sensitivity months after. Now, there is an answer to this. Of course, when you seize the androgens, when you stop, cut, stop the androgens, the estrogen goes sky high, especially when you introduce yourself to PCT, post-cycle therapy, mm. that the endogenous testosterone that is elevated by HCG and SARMs will eventually aromatize itself. Mm. However, if you use testosterone and fate and nandrolone, decaonate, or uh, boldenone, which is uh, undisciplinate, very very long ester, mm. uh, this will gradually be released within the system right after your, your PCT maybe, or uh, a long time after you stop steroids, and these uh, esters will eventually uh, maybe aromatize, and uh, the fact also you're not using any aromatase inhibitors after the cycle, and the fact also you stop the androgens will make this imbalance in the hormones. And uh, I suggest the guys to measure E1, E2, E3, and prolactin, these four uh, exams. So beta estradiol E2 is the main representative, estron in one and estriol E3, along with prolactin. And if even in this case they are within range, I suggest them to consult a general surgeon in order to see if there is any uh, lipodystrophy over here or there is a, um, the mammary gland itself, it's uh, swollen and it has to be removed wow. for cosmetic reasons. Yeah. So once that gyno is there, Surgery is the only option, right? It's never you're not. There's nothing you can take that's well, going to make that if, go away. Well, if, if it's an elevation of prolactin or estrogen, you may use tabergulin or aromatase inhibitors. Mm. But sometimes it's not. It does not respond. Yeah, I mean, if it did, then people wouldn't be getting gyno surgery. You know, nobody yes. wants. It's expensive, and like insurance usually doesn't pay for it. Here, yeah, so. about five k, and quite many athletes do this. In order not to have this, uh, Ronnie Coleman had uh, some obvious genicomastia. Yeah? A lot of top bodybuilders. You know, Rami had it. Rami had it. Excuse me, and estrogens. Yeah. I assume. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can probably name off the top of my head, 20, 20 top bodybuilders that had gyno at one time. But, but also, they, also, they also, mm -hmm. aldactone, spironolactone can give you genicomastia because it disrupts the, the yes, it's genicomastia induced by aldactone also. Uh, some uh, hold on, that's a diuretic. Yes, but diuretic it also can give you gyno. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yes, it's, it's within the side effects of aldactone, so it's spironolactone induced genicomastia. Okay. Okay, here's another one of those very general questions. So this is a good chance for you to: What is considered a replacement dosage, and what would be considered an effective super physiological? I think he means what's the word super super physiological dose. So we saw, we're talking about uh, testosterone, I guess. Yes. So uh, physiological would be the the supposed dose that it keeps you within range, the highest range, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to myself, the 200 milligrams will give me 1,100. To you, may give you 700. It's different. Right. The kind of androgen receptors you have, and the body mass index, several things. Uh, also, SHBG and uh, many factors. Um, now, above this, it's a super physiological, and uh, where also the performance enhancer results take place. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's say that, you know, uh, say 200 is about the upper limit for replacement dosage. Uh, are there people out there, because I believe O'Connor, Dr. O'Connor one time we were talking about, he had one patient who required like 600 milligrams of testosterone just to be around 800 uh 800, you know, in the in the free testosterone, not free, in the total testosterone week. There are people who do, just like there are people who only need about 50 milligrams a week, there are some extreme yes. cases that need probably 300, 400, maybe even 500. How did he explain that? How did he explain that? He said the guy just, uh, he had his, he burned up, he had a metabolism that burned up the drugs. He was a CrossFit guy, and his body sort of uh, processed it very rapidly. You know, he he said he'd never seen anything like it before. Cause it would be unfair for him to use half a gram and have the same levels as somebody else who's using one quarter of a gram. Yeah, well, it's a medically it's medically uh, prescribed, so he's not breaking any rules or anything. But I believe that guy did need something like five or six hundred a week. Um, but you know, 
the difference also, so if we're talking 200 is about the upper limit, 250 for a replacement dosage, you know, I can't, I can't imagine people are going to get much results in terms of extreme muscle mass oh, unless, no, not, no. Unless, unless they go pretty far beyond that. Yeah, but I started uh, TRT and HRT in January of 2015. Yeah. Now I'm almost four and a half years. And I'm in a better place of muscularity and uh, lean gains as if I was hypogonadic for four times. So in, within four and a half years, they contribute even this small amount, hmm. some uh, effects, right? Yeah. It's better na than zero when I was before, of course. You're not that much smaller than when you were competing. You know, you've, I guess it's muscle, yeah, the, it's muscle maturity. Fat, the, the muscle has yes, a different look, too. For 46, I mean, uh, I feel pretty good than I was in 41 when I was hypogonadic, right after I retired. Yeah. My total T was 150 only. Mm. Yeah. So I couldn't uh, function with these levels. Well, you wouldn't want to. <laughs> in a way, in a way, all bodybuilders, we're kind of blessed because we are in the juice for the rest of our life. Of course, physiological doses, we, we, we have to, rather than other guys who are not connected with the plug and they start to decline, mm -hmm. and then they have to uh, elevate this, or we're connected with testosterone for life. <laughs> yeah, it's a blessing and a curse, let's put it that way. Uh, so this last question, I'm not sure what he was referring to, because he asked you, doctor, do you need to split the dose up throughout the day, or can you take it all at once? Do you know what he was referring to? Uh, with testosterone, I guess. Oh, okay. I so, yes, or, cause, well, let's back up though, because orals, we know you've said this before that orals you split for maximum effectiveness, you do split up oral doses uh, according to the half life of the particular, which is approximately eight to nine hours, so three times a day. Okay, um, uh, so now the injectables, yeah. uh, the injectables, for instance, the, the water base, which is Winstrol and testosterone, it used to be also Trembolone. We preferably use it right before the gym in order to have this kind of kick because they're rapidly introduced as a water base. They do not have any ester, so they all of them utilize all the milligrams, and uh, they work just like pills right into in, into the bloodstream. Uh, this is the suspension. Now, acetate has to be introduced either every day or every other day. To the it's ninety percent. Propionate every other day it's eighty percent. Enanthate and cepionate twice a week, which is seventy. It is seventy percent. Now, deca and nebido is the is the the slowest speed, uh, and there is sixty percent of the material released only. So forty percent is wasted. Ugh. Yes. Terrible. And the the half life is, I mean, no, the detection time in uh, doping control is eighteen months. Wow. You get busted one and a half year afterwards. Terrible. Right? Yeah. Yes. And nobody would believe you if you say, I haven't yes. used anything in a year and a half, they'd say, yes. you're a liar. <laughs> so was, with, with injectables, there was, there's, there, even the fastest acting injectables, you don't. there's no benefit to, to injecting more than once a day then, right? Well, uh, I mean, if you, tra if you train twice a day, okay, uh, with, with 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., 12 hours window, Okay, you may use 100 milligrams of suspension AM and PM, okay. or 50 milligrams of whistle, but I think it's too enough, too too much of it. No. Yeah. Maybe some people really like injecting. I don't know. For instance, using using Primo three times a week is not necessary for the end of faith. Mm. It's waste. Hmm. You the same dose, split it twice instead of every other day. So this is probably a question, but uh, it should have been a question that. Uh, I throw on extra onto that, but so for these enanthates, all these long esters, uh, a lot of it gets wasted. It sounds like. Yes, I mean, for from the 100 milligrams of enanthate, you you get 70, and the third the 30 milligrams are wasted. Wow. From deca, 40 milligrams. Uh, from uh, Winstrol, zero. From trembolone acetate, 10 percent get wasted. Hmm. From propionate pro, uh, testosterone, twenty percent. Hmm. Okay, CPN is the same, sixty-eight to seventy-one. Hmm. Also, half life of a week. Yeah. So the more drug you introduce, uh, I mean, no, I mean, if you compare tremble on acetate, tremble on acetate, acetate is more effective because of the milligrams you utilize. Hmm. 
but it also has to be injected on a daily basis. The pinning is more frequent, and this maybe will freak you out. Yeah, but the sounds like the price you pay for not having to inject yes. as often is you lose a lot of the drug. Yes, oh, yes. Terrible, terrible. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Well, <laughs> theoretically speaking, the most effective testosterone is the suspension one. Mm. It's all of the you utilize. Yeah. And Western also. It's a phrase, you know, it brings to mind a phrase I use all the time when I see someone who's I know is on a lot of drugs and they don't look that good. I always say, what a waste of perfectly good steroids. Somebody else could have made much they, better gains. <laughs> they don't diet well or they don't train enough or they don't have good genetics and they blame afterwards the drugs for being faked. Right. Yeah. Sometimes the drugs are fake, but most of the time it's it's them. They're the problem, not the drugs. No, I, I suggest to my to, to people when they they ask me, shall I get into a cycle? I tell them that you have to be already ready with slightly with abdominals, uh, I mean low body fat for ten percent in order to make the most of the drugs. Mm. You cannot be a flabby and and and, and, and be from uh, and become fabulous from flab. Yeah. You know, you have to be already in a good shape in order to go up to number ten with the steroids. You cannot be up to five. See, a lot of these people that are flabby, they, they think steroids burn fat. They think yeah, they're going to lose. I mean, yeah, wrongly, yes. They are not the the silver bullet. Yeah, I mean, I've had the, the dumbest questions on, like, Instagram. If I post a con an old contest picture of mine when I was really lean, someone will say, how much trend were you on? Because they yeah. think that's the key. It must have been, must have yeah, been yeah. the trend that made so me look So if like I take that. the same as you'll become uh, exactly. as good as... <laughs> you'll be shredded. You'll have strided glutes and... Serratus like piano keys, all that good stuff. Cool. Well, Doctor, that's been another great episode. We threw in extra questions this week. I don't know if people realize yeah. that. That was uh, nine questions this time. So yeah, it's a gift. I want to encourage people another time to check out this book, Bodybuilding, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Get that on gtool.com, G-T-O-U-L.com, and pick up Muscular Development Magazine every month. Dr. Tuliados has his column in there. Good stuff. So seven weeks for the O, huh? Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm curious because uh, I'm heading out to Tampa in a few days. Dexter's supposed to, you know, if yeah. he does compete, which I'm pretty sure he's going to, that's going to be a, a pretty easy win for Dexter Jackson, I would think. He, he want to make it to 30. 30, yeah, 30 pro wins, which we'll never see. You and I are not going to live to see anybody else win 30 pro shows. In a he's career. turning Supermaster, but there are no Supermasters Olympia anymore. It's probably for the best. Yeah. I mean, those Masters Olympias... When they had the age categories, they had a, like... You remember Pete Taylor and Robbie Robinson? Yeah, but then, I don't know if you remember, a couple of years they did like an over 50 class and an over 60 class. Oh, in Miami. Yeah, and yeah, the guys didn't look that good. Because they were legends. These are guys that I used to look up to and have pictures up on my wall. And to see them, you know, at age 55 or 60 when they're... Bakels, Bakels, yeah. Albert Bakels. He looked great, but I'm saying most of these guys, by the time they hit 55 or 60, there's nothing they can do to look... And and impressive you, also pretty yeah, good yeah they, they time has passed them Gary by. Yeah. yeah Gary Strider man he was great all right well Dr. Tuliados thank you so much for sharing your time your knowledge your expertise helping the men of the world all the uh, all the enhanced people out there who have nobody else to turn to for legitimate medical medical advice thank you so much you're welcome all right and guys we will see you next time on ask Dr. Testosterone thanks for watching